I just finished rewatching the first season of Steven Universe for the first time in a while. And oh man. That's what I'm talking about. This means something to me, man. I haven't forgotten how great these episodes were, but I definitely have a deeper appreciation for them as I've grown older, and I just want to gush about them. Lucky for me, there was recently talk about how these episodes, aka the first Steven Bomb, premiered the same week as Gravity Falls' incredible mid-season 2 finale, not what he seems, nine years ago in March 2015. Yeah, sorry to remind all of you that we're getting ancient. Looking back on it, this was definitely one of the craziest weeks in animation. Two shows having major event episodes that not only lived up to the insanely high expectations, but had immeasurable impacts on the internet that branched out way beyond their fandoms. It was truly a beautiful moment in history to be a fan of cartoons. Too bad outside of a group chat of friends from summer camp, no one around me cared. My friends at my school didn't watch these shows, so they didn't know what the hell my hyperfixated ass was talking about. I remember info dumping the climax of Not What He Seems to my girlfriend at the time, and she was just kind of like... <laughs> and this was pre-YouTube, so I didn't have an outlet for my yapping. Thus, on the behalf of my cringy teenage self, I want to snort some lines of grade-A nostalgia and revisit these absolute game-changers. Unpacking why they're not only amazing episodes of television, but why they're the definition of you just had to be there. We gotta start with the masterpiece that is Gravity Falls Season 2 Episode 11. Not what he seems. Truly a perfect episode with the perfect build-up. I really don't know if we could ever again experience like this again. The show itself had already been setting up a major reveal with Crickle Stan since the very first episode. He's always maintained this perception of the ultimate con man, at least to the audience, deceiving not only his customers, but his niece and nephew. As although most of his screen time showcased him as a wacky, purely money-motivated individual, ignorant to the true nature of the town, there were glimpses of a man whose moves were actually quite calculated harboring a huge secret that he kept extremely close to the chest. For Pete's sake! That page at the end of the theme song with Bill and the Zodiac has a code that says Stan is not what he seems. The show is warning us every single episode through this image. As if there weren't enough red flags, the end of season one left us all speechless with the revelation that Stan was now in possession of all three journals, holding on to the first one all this time apparently needing them to operate a giant portal that's been lying dormant underneath the mystery shack. This truly came out of nowhere as a kid. Why does Stan have this portal? What's his connection to the author of the journals? And do his intentions paint him as a hero or a villain? The show refused to answer any of these questions throughout the first half of season two. Instead, the Gravity Falls crew opted to confuse the audience even further. Stan doesn't want him or his family to get mixed up in the town's supernatural antics, but he himself is tinkering with a mysterious otherworldly device that attracts danger to his front door. He puts his life on the line to protect Dipper and Mabel, yet he swears that even they won't get in the way of pulling off his master plan. There was clearly a major detail being left out out of all of this, something that would cause everything to click. Unless this man was truly just some psychopath plotting world domination. Now, a lot of eagle-eyed fans were able to put all the pieces together so far ahead of time that Alex Hirsch had to fake a leak to throw him off the trail. The theory that Stan had a twin brother named Stanley, who we saw in episode 9. Something bad happened to him, and Stan might be trying to get him back. Now, teenage me didn't know what to think, but one of my summer camp friends took one look at that theory and said, It's the biggest piece of dog shit that I have ever heard. And he stood on business. Until about 9.28 p.m. EST on March 9, 2015. But I think in general, a lot of viewers didn't know what to expect. We didn't know whether or not Grickle Stan was really a good guy, which is exactly what Hirsch wanted. As on February 16th, 2015, we got the episode Northwest Mansion Mystery. 22 minutes of television that Dipsivica shippers are clinging onto to this very day. Despite the episode being a little removed from the overarching story, the ending sprung on a cliffhanger I could never forget. Old Man the Gucket tracking down Dipper to inform him that he fixed the old laptop and that he's worried something big's about to go down. Dipper dismisses Fiddleford, taking it easy for a change. But the show lets us know that this, this is, is serious chase. business, as we see the laptop has an ominous countdown, before lingering on a tapestry depicting the one and only Bill Cipher, implying the Dree Demon's own plans are about to pay off. 
Not to mention the post credit scene featuring the government agents, ready to make their own moves to see Stan and the portal. And the cryptogram on this episode's puzzle piece just repeats, Stan is not what he seems, Stan is not what he seems, Stan is not what he seems. The next day, Alex Hirsch tweeted eight words that are burned into my memory. I wonder where Grunkle Stan was last night. Followed by a link to the same countdown found at the end of Northwest Mansion Mystery. Set to conclude as soon as Not What He Seems premiered on the East Coast. This tweet was the moment I realized, oh god, this was the first episode Stan wasn't in, which for some reason created a lot of dread in return. The countdown itself was hosted on a legendary fan site by the name The Mystery of Gravity Falls. Which might have well have been official. If you were involved with the fan base, you probably remember it or the YouTube channel by the same name. It featured practically every promo, every cryptogram, every end credit scene, and every puzzle piece from the show, updating as it aired. It helped create a super immersive experience that you didn't really get with other shows at the time or the shows that came out after Gravity Falls. The only real contender being, well, Steven Universe. And Hirsch's occasional involvement with the site only added to the immersion. But this was only the first step in hyping us up for this massive episode. Disney XD's marketing was pretty insane. Despite keeping pretty much everything about Season 2 under wraps on an episode-to-episode -episode basis, the promos were pretty blunt without giving too much away, expressing that this was THE episode of Gravity Falls we were waiting for, to pay off to 30 episodes and 3 years of investment. It's happening! The end's time! You don't know your uncle at all. The Gravity Falls you waited for. Monday, March 9th at 8.30 on Disney XD. I won't beat around the bush. The episode didn't just deliver. It somehow surpassed expectations. Which was hard for a lot of shows to pull off. Especially animated series because, on its face, it's the medium that allows anything to happen. Of course, the reality is these shows have to work with limited time and resources, the budget isn't infinite, and even episodes marketed as big events can't always go all out. But I wasn't thinking about these things as a dumb kid. I just bought into the marketing and often found myself disappointed when a special episode didn't feature every character under the sun and a big action set piece. Yet not what he seems was the rare exception. Again, this thing surpassed expectations, and the magic of the episode still hasn't worn off nine years later, after I've watched it at least a dozen times. I still get chills at the cold open. From the portal test recreating Dipper and Mabel getting lifted from their beds, to one of the journals flipping through pages that allude to what's in store for the second half of the season, such as the UFO dented cliff and the unicorn. Not What He Seems is a masterclass in building tension. There are so many moments where there is just a pit in my stomach the first time watching this. Dipper, Mabel, and Stan having this extremely wholesome Saturday morning. It's cute, but the whole time I'm just waiting for it to go wrong. My anxiety spiked as the stakes got raised higher and higher. Don't even get me started on the moment the gang found the elevator. Descending down the stairway that has Ford's handprint on the wall? The bone-chilling rendition of the theme? This is the power of animation right here. You really don't know what's going to happen. Is the portal a doomsday device? Is Stan really someone that's not to be trusted? A villain? They've put us in Dipper and Mabel's shoes flawlessly. And just like them, we want to hope for the best, yet are preparing for the worst. The government agents are the perfect antagonists for this episode, because not only are they justified in their beliefs that this sketchy old dude could be hiding a machine capable of ending the world, but nothing they're saying is technically wrong. They have no real stake in the family drama, they're just coming from a place of objectivity. Yet it's that objectivity and laying all the facts out on the table that causes the Pines family to fall apart. The best example of this being the scene between Dipper and Agent Trigger after Dipper and Mabel escape. Everything Trigger says tracks. Stan has been lying to the whole world. He has been putting up a facade around the kids. How could whatever he's planning be in the family's best interest? It all just goes to show that the Gravity Falls crew succeeded in making Stan the show's biggest mystery. I can't even articulate the absolute gut punch Mabel reading the newspaper was. Seeing the word Stan Pines dead made me feel like I was dead. It was the moment that solidified whoever we've been watching for a season and a half wasn't Stanford Pines. Now, I just said that this episode put us in different Mabel's shoes but I really want to elaborate on how Dipper and Mabel really reflect two sides of the fan base. The characters and viewers alike are thrown into uncharted territory, and to maintain that feeling, the episode doesn't tell you how to feel about the situation. Instead, it justifies giving Stan the benefit of the doubt through Mabel, while also justifying any skepticism of his intentions through Dipper. 
In a way, I think it can also reflect the people who love everything about Gravity Falls and its episodic nature, versus the people who love the show, but really love the lore. The mystery! And there's nothing inherently wrong with that, I'm someone who clearly favors lore-heavy shows. But most of the time, the people who champion those aspects exclusively tend to miss the forest for the trees. I never fully understood that expression, because if I'm in the forest, then all I'm seeing are trees. Like Dipper, they're in a rush to get to the finish line. They're eager to get all the answers, and they tend to care less about the one-off adventures, often perceiving them as filler. Unlike Mabel and the people who embrace everything about the show, Mabel wants summer to last forever. She wants to make every moment count. She doesn't care if the adventure of the week brings them one step closer to uncovering the town's secrets. She's just enjoying the time she has with her friends and family before going back home. Much like the people who enjoy every episode because they know it won't last forever. They just want to stay in this world for as long as they can. From this perspective, it's telling that everything comes down to Mabel, the person who tries to see the best in everyone, and is used to every conflict sorting itself out in 22 minutes. Despite being in a terrifying predicament, she still places her trust in Stan, and I think that's partly because Mabel cherishes all of her memories with Stan. While Dipper, who built his entire summer vacation around the journals and let the mystery define his investment in Gravity Falls, can't bring it to himself to fully trust Stan because he's almost always prioritized his own beliefs above Stan's wishes. It's in his nature to question everything, which ironically almost stops him from finally uncovering the truth. I think this is also reflected in Seuss, someone who's been used as a stand-in for the audience a handful of times. He's kind of a balance between fans who favor the episodic stuff and fans who favor the serialized bits, but he's always leaned a bit more into being a skeptic. So it makes sense that when push comes to shove, he choose to keep Stan away from Dipper and Mabel. Man, this moment breaks my heart every single time I watch this episode. Seuss loves Stan so much that it's very distressing seeing him turn on the guy, albeit it's a valid reaction given the circumstances. I don't think this mirror to the audience was 100% intentional, but it's definitely something I picked up on this time around and I just wanted to put it out there. The climax of this episode is truly insane, and I don't think a single episode after was ever able to top it. Not even Weird Mageddon. Not just because of all the character drama and the big reveal, but also because of this episode's anomaly. The portal itself disrupting gravity, causing gravity to literally fall. Hey, that's the name of the show. Peak! It's, it's just peak! Seeing gravity fluctuate more and more until it looks like something out of the rapture is wild. There's something uncanny about seeing the buildings and phone booths fall apart as they get lifted up into the air. We're used to seeing them as static backgrounds, so I'm sure figuring out a way to get the motion without betraying the style the backgrounds are rendered in was tough to figure out. I would love to see a full deep dive into the making of this episode someday. Hirsch, if you end up watching this, let's try to make something happen next year for the 10th anniversary. Bill's presence in this episode, despite not actually appearing in it, is something else worth noting, as it added so much tension to the atmosphere of this episode the first time around. Namely during Dipper and Mabel's standoff with Seuss, where the Bill Cipher rug is staring directly at the feuding family. When this episode premiered, we still knew very little about Bill and his role in all of this, just that he's always watching and has something nefarious up his sleeve. And although the most we got out of him was that he observed this feud, he did ultimately use Dipper and Mabel's impending conflict to his advantage. So you could argue this moment showed him that the best route in unleashing the apocalypse lies in tearing the Pines family apart. But let's dig into the ending of Not What He Seems. What cemented this to many as the best episode of the show? My heart dropped when Mabel floated up to the portal. For a moment, I thought she was about to find herself lost in the multiverse, and we spend the back half of the season trying to get her back. Once that countdown hits zero, you have no idea where the show is going. If the agents were right about the portal destroying the universe, I couldn't tell you what was going through my head, as everyone was engulfed by the portal's blinding light. The fear I felt as the mystery shack was suspended in midair. It truly felt like the world came to a screeching halt. Thankfully, instead of the apocalypse, the portal provided the perfect reveal of the author of the journals, who emerges from the machine and wastes no time recovering his first book. My jaw dropped all the way to the floor and stayed there for at least a half hour. Despite the journals being a huge focus of the episode, I just didn't anticipate that we'd learn the author's identity this soon. I just thought we'd learn something about Stan and maybe get a cameo from Bill. So, who's it gonna be? Bill Cipher's twin brother Tat Strange? Dipper from the future? Le Bam?
the author of the journals. My brother. Before I could even process the Stanley theory being real, the episode was over. With the stinger being the biggest emotional gun punch of the entire 22 minutes. The two brothers swinging on the same set that was destroyed in Stan's mind enjoying their time together in complete silence. Without saying a word, they conveyed everything we needed to know, and suddenly, everything clicked. That the story of Stan Pines, all along, was a tragedy, one that he was desperate to fix. The hidden codes for this episode translating to the original Mystery Twins, and 30 years and now he's back, the mystery in the Mystery Shack. Some cryptic words for us to chew on for the next five months as the show went on hiatus. Even though it just came back from a holiday break, but you know, animation is hard and time consuming. We were already getting these episodes on a bi weekly basis. Clearly, they are trying to stay on top of production while also keeping the fans fed. The finale aired what? A week or two after they finished it? They were working their asses off of Gravity Falls, boy. The reaction to this episode is exactly what you would expect. Everyone came together to lose their collective minds over what was once viewed as a crackpot theory coming to fruition. It felt like a victory for the fandom, in a way we haven't really seen in a show before. Like, comparatively, Adventure Time had already confirmed that the series was set in a post-apocalyptic future. Something else that was a pretty popular fan theory. But confirmation of that theory didn't really shake up the status quo like this did. Especially since the more shocking reveal was the Ice King's origin story. Something that I don't recall many people catching on to prior to Holly Jolly Secrets. But this was a twist that not only recontextualized the show, but changed its entire trajectory moving forward. The addition of four concluded so many theories that were also staples of the show. Even the journals couldn't serve the same narrative purpose because their living embodiment now resides in the basement. The magnitude of this reveal just can't be overstated. And while the internet was sworn with the author of the journals memes for a while after, I think the bigger impact Not What He Seems had can be found in the peers of Gravity Falls, other animated series with an overarching story. This episode raised the bar for unveiling your show's major revelation. How to increase the scale while also telling an intimate story with a limited cast of characters. I'm not gonna say every cartoon wanted to make their own Not What He Seems, that they were purposely trying to live up to these heights, but I do think it served as an example Example of how to do episodes like this right. A single pale rose, big reveal, hollow mind, true colors, hell, even the Rick Shake redemption. They all feel like they might have taken cues from this episode while still managing to do their own thing. I know that may sound like a stretch that I'm glazing Gravity Falls, but watch all of those episodes back and you'll see what I mean. How they pit characters against each other, make us wonder if we can trust beloved fan favorites. How they recontextualize a certain character and all of their actions thus far. How they maintain a cinematic atmosphere throughout and raise the stakes as the viewers enter the point of no return. It feels like a certain type of episode that didn't exist before Gravity Falls laid the groundwork. Like, maybe you could argue Grandpa Max being a plumber, but <laughs> nah nigga, that was season one. And it's crazy because when the team first pitched this episode, Disney hated it. When we first pitched it to Disney executives, they thought it was bad <laughs> because it didn't have a lot of jokes in it. Like, I remember normally when we're pitching our episodes to the executives, we can gauge how good they are by how much people laugh. And people didn't really laugh at that one because it's really tense. So we thought maybe we screwed up. But when the animation came back and we watched it, we're like, oh, it's good that it's tense. Like, it works. I don't know if that's my favorite episode, but I think that's the episode that I feel like we should have won an Emmy for, and I'm still pissed we didn't. Executives, man! They may think they know business, but they are definitely out of touch with the fans if they couldn't see that this one would bang. Not What He Seems earned itself the title as the best episode of the series. As even Hirsch himself claimed, it stuck with me throughout the last decade, and it's inspired me to one day make an episode of television that could be even half as brilliant as it is. Too bad the industry sucks and I'm too broke to make a pilot. Throughout its first season, Steven Universe was slowly unmasking its true story. This show wasn't just chronicling the misadventures of a boy who inherited gem powers from his late mother. It was also easing us into the startling revelation that he also 
also inherited a civil war. His caretakers and mentors are aliens who defected from their home planet, now forced to face the very real possibility that their battle isn't over just yet. With the real story unfolding and the season nearing its end, Cartoon Network decided to conclude this first chapter of the series while simultaneously starting the next one in the form of a week-long event, The Steven Bomb. Premiering six new episodes over the course of five days that provided a satisfying through line for the viewers at home. These episodes being Rose's Scabbard, The Message, Political Power, The Return, Joe Break, and Full Disclosure. The Return and Joe Break serving as the big climax, airing together on Thursday, March 12th, while Full Disclosure, the first episode of season two, functioned as an epilogue airing the following day. I went into this week as a casual fan of the series. I hadn't seen every episode, and I wasn't familiar with all the lore. Like, I didn't even know every gem had she, her pronouns. <laughs> But by the end of the week, I was already in the process of watching every episode of the series, and felt a deep connection forming with it. Although the episode that won me over and turned me into a certified super fan probably isn't the one you're thinking. Still, these stretch of episodes are incredible, especially in the context of the Steven Bomb. Although its format ultimately overstayed its welcome, I wouldn't change a thing about how these episodes aired and the atmosphere they created. It wasn't unheard of for networks to have a week of premieres for a certain show. Nickelodeon did it seven to eight years prior with Danny Phantom and Avatar The Last Airbender. But the difference is that those premieres felt like the network burning off episodes and speeding towards the end. Steven Bomb felt like something reminiscent of old school Toonami, the anime block on Adult Swim and formerly on Cartoon Network. While I was too young to remember too much of its weekday run, I always admired the idea of Cartoon Network acquiring these serialized anime and airing them on a daily basis after school. It gave kids something to look forward to every day beyond basic reruns. It was basically soap opera for kids, but better. Applying this format to a show that at this point was still largely episodic felt special. It felt important, the kind of aura that usually radiate from a TV movie. The vibe that this week would end with the show in a completely different place from where it started. And that's exactly what happened. Now, unlike Not What He Seems, instead of deep diving into every single episode of this bomb, I mainly want to focus on how each episode contributed to the event's narrative in a meaningful way. Partially because this video is already way longer than I anticipated, and also because I've been itching to dig back into Steve Universe content, and a lot of these episodes are better suited for videos focusing on character analysis rather than a stroll down memory lane. Steven Bomb began on March 9th, 2015, with Rose's Scabbard. A turning point for the series that sets the stage for the event perfectly as it hones in on something that would remain a constant in the original series until the very last episode. Rose's habit of keeping secrets and how those secrets negatively impact the people who loved her. Especially Pearl who obviously thought she knew everything there was to know about Rose. Golly! I knew episodes like this one would hit different when revisiting them as someone who's experienced the loss of a partner, but I really feel for Pearl here. She dedicated her life to Rose, and can't fathom the idea that she didn't know every side of her, that Rose would leave her out of something. She already internalized Rose and Greg's romance as her not being good enough, and I think the mere presence of Lion in this episode validates those fears. No, Rose didn't have a lion, because if Rose had a lion, I would have known about it. We see her transform from eager to jaded as she tries to show Steven all these traces of his mom, only to learn that Steven's already familiar with all of this thanks to Lion. Pearl feels like she can't even honor Rose's legacy, and it makes her question her purpose. Why Rose is gone, yet she's still here. Wondering what Rose would think of her if she saw who Pearl was today. Leading to that beautiful moment where Steven hugs his bird mom and tells her, Well, I think you're pretty great. <laughs> Again, I'd rather save full-blown analysis for another time, maybe a Pearl video. But I really do adore the end of this episode, especially with this moment concluding with Steven and Pearl atop of Lion. It's been stated before, but whereas other shows would try to smooth things over, with Pearl showing affection towards Steven with a rub on the head or something, we instead just have Pearl taking in the moment. Steven gave her reassurance, but her scars aren't healed because of it. She's still very much devastated about everything, and I respect that the show doesn't try to sugarcoat it. 
And although this is a great episode to leave Pearl's arc on for the season, shifting gears to a bigger focus on Homeworld, where it really shines in the context of the Steven Bomb, is how it sets up Rose and the Crystal Gems as, well, war criminals. The conversation with Rose recounted by Pearl has the former leader explicitly state that she's choosing to defy Homeworld in order to protect Earth, that doing so means she can never return home, and that this is a life or death situation. To Pearl, this is just an attempt to find comfort through a cherished memory. But to Steven and the audience, this is confirmation of something we've been suspecting for a hot minute. The second episode of The Steven Bomb, The Message, is a pretty straightforward adventure that puts Greg at the forefront as he desperately tries to prove to the gems that he can be a valuable asset to them, as he tries his best to decipher a message being transmitted to the Wailing Stone. It's tough revisiting this one, knowing that the gems persuaded Greg into letting them raise Steven. While he trusts them and agreed with their perspective, at least to an extent, you can tell that he may have his regrets as they discarded him completely. They don't take him seriously. The only gem he has a semblance of a relationship with at this point is Amethyst, and even that's accompanied with very complex feelings. So on rewatch, I was really rooting for Greg in this episode, and it was satisfying to see him and Steven actually figure things out and get this signal working. Too bad the message is laughing being the bearer of bad news, letting the gems know that Paradox is headed to Earth with backup. Only two days into the Steven bomb, and we already know what's on the horizon. An invasion! For most, this or political power may have been the weakest episode of the bunch, but I honestly couldn't imagine this story arc without them. The calm before the storm still feeling like a storm when the characters are still trying to prove themselves to each other rather than putting a proper plan into action. And speaking of political power, this was the third episode of the Steven Bomb and a shining example of the kind of towny episodes the show was lacking in its later seasons. I know a lot of people grew apathetic towards the towny episodes by the end of the series, but I think the problem was that they stopped incorporating gem shenanigans and exploring Steven's powers, things that made season one so enjoyable. While political power doesn't have corrupted gems or Steven discovering a new ability, it does relate Dewey handling the power outage in Beach City back to Steven and the gems in a pretty meaningful way. Steven understands that Dewey's tendency to lie to the townsfolk, while not good, is his way of protecting them because he doesn't want them to worry, and he applies this to the gems who are pretty much in the same boat as Dewey with Steven. After talking things out with the gems, they admit they're afraid because Paradise is an Era 2 gem. They have no idea what to expect because they're clueless about how much Homeworld has changed. But just like the townsfolk and Dewey, all Steven and the gems can do is rely on each other and face this impending threat together. If the show had more episodes like this throughout its run, people would probably be a lot sweeter on Towny episodes. Again, I respect this show so much for not sugarcoating the reality of the situation, ending on a bittersweet note rather than forcing a happy ending. Although the hyperfixation didn't set in for me yet, I just know this had to be a painful 24 hours waiting for the next installment of the Steven Bomb, especially with it being the big one. This brings us to the main event, Thursday's back-to-back -back premieres, The Return and Jailbreak. One of the best season finales to ever air on Cartoon Network that caused a truly insane domino effect. The first half of this finale, The Return, is a slow burn but a damn good one. The sudden appearance of the ship, seeing the Mahesh Warren's empty house as Steven leaves a concerning voicemail, the color palette slowly getting engulfed by the ship's green hue, it all does such a great job at creating a tense atmosphere. It really does feel like the world is ending. Of course, Greg laying the gem's business out on the table and Steven standing up for himself as a crystal gem are huge highlights that help make the episode what it is. But the real meat and potatoes is without a doubt the return of Peridot and Lapis, and especially the introduction of the kindergarten courts who could. Jasper. Coda's introduction of any character in the entire series. Even the diamonds, fight me. We didn't know how many gems would be escorting Peridot on this mission the show leading us to believe it could be a handful of soldiers. So for it to only be one, and for her to immediately strike fear in Steven, is just so damn cool to me. And her cool factor is only amplified by how unbothered she is by the whole situation, casually revealing so much lore by shitting on the gems. We learned that gems can be considered defective, figuratively and literally. Jasper's insult to Pearl implies that there are other pearls out there. I guess Rose saying my pearl also gives that away, but the first time around, it's meant to be figurative. 
This isn't figurative, it's just vague. Jasper single-handedly expands our understanding of this universe in a situation that she doesn't care about. Until Steven breaks out the shield. Then she goes full on Vegeta, referring to Steven by his gemstone as she thinks this is the Rose Quartz, the one who shattered her diamond. Of course, we don't know all that yet, but again, this is why starring the Bomb of Rose's Scabbard was genius. We only knew Steven's mom up to this point as a kind, nurturing leader. To go from that wholesome image, to learning she started a war, and seeing an elite gem soldier freak out at what they think is the mere sight of her, how could you not reconsider your entire perception of the show at that point? And how could you not question what Steven is capable of? Give it five years and you'll find out. Now, animation fans were probably given too much trauma this week. I thought reading the headline, Stan Pine's dead, and Sue's tackling his father figure would hold the crown for biggest fucked up thing I saw that week. But Steven Universe said, hold my beer, and gave us this. This had to be, without a doubt, one of the most stressful commercial breaks in television history. All right, this is the one you've all been waiting for. Jailbreak. An episode that sets itself apart from everything that's come before it, from the title card alone. I don't care what anyone says. This is some of the craziest 11 minutes that's ever aired on Cartoon Network. The show's always excelled at making gem stuff cool yet creepy, but this episode cranks it up to 11. For starters, the sound design in this episode is nuts, and it does so much of the heavy lifting in the first half of this episode. And that's not a dig on the art direction or storyboards or music. The crew went all out every step of the way for this one. But without the eerie ambiance, the low humming of the cell's force field, the way Jasper's footsteps or Sapphire's song echoes throughout the halls, all of this would be cool, but not creepy which is important because I think you lose a lot of the tension if you don't find this place just a little bit unsettling. I mean, even Steven himself finds it a little cool as he discovers his resistance to destabilization tech. And he's the one trapped on it with a black eye. Just like how people caught on to the Stan twins far ahead of the big reveal, a lot of people figured out that Garnet was actually a fusion before the show spotted it out for us. But man, it had to be so confusing watching this for the first time and having no idea who Ruby and Sapphire are and having no idea where Garnet is. Personally, I missed the premiere and got spoiled on Twitter. They were really playing chess with Ruby and Sapphire, man. How do we introduce a meaningful LGBT relationship in a time where gay marriage isn't even legal without getting censored? Well, let's introduce Fusion super early on in the series, establish that it's the personification of a relationship, and then do the ultimate mic drop by revealing that one of our main characters is actually a fusion of two gems in a loving relationship. That every time they're Garnet, they're actively expressing their love. Genius. What you gonna do about it? Go back and edit Garnet out of every single episode? I don't think so. These bitches aren't just gay. They're perma-gay, and you just have to deal with it, Russia. Oh, fuck! Of course, the iconic part of this episode is Garnet's song, Stronger Than You. What was, at the time, the highly anticipated Estelle musical number. We had Pearl and Amethyst sing up to this point, but the Crooniverse knew they had to save the international sensation for a special occasion. And this is as special as it gets. Stronger Than You was responsible for truly putting Steven Universe on the map. It was hard to explore nerdy spaces on the internet without encountering this jam after the episode premiered. People weren't just moving and grooving to the song, but they were intrigued by these two characters doing their best shonen anime impressions. Spin dashing and giving each other the pause. And the song ended up transcending Steven Universe itself once Undertale released later in the year, eventually leading to a fan parody that surpassed the original in views. There was a point where a good amount of people didn't even know this came from Steven Universe. They thought it was just an Undertale fan song. Breaking barriers with representation. And putting out one of the best songs of 2015. This show is powerful. The end of this episode still blows my mind. Lapis and Jasper refusing to become Malachite. Only for Lapis to hijack the fusion and trap them underwater. Despite her limited screen time throughout the season, they still managed to give Lapis a satisfying throughline that also sets up a plot thread for the next season. Refusing to continue being a prisoner and choosing to become the warden instead. Although she still very much is imprisoning herself, harming herself. But she justifies it to herself because at least this time, she has control over the situation. Man, I want to do videos on all these characters so bad.
Jailbreak really changed everything, man. An incredible payoff to 51 episodes of television that ends one chapter while starting a new one. And while this would have been a stellar conclusion to the Steven Bomb in its own right, we still have one more episode that serves as an epilogue. The episode where I fell in love with Steven Universe. You see, I loved Jailbreak, but again, I had yet to see every episode when it premiered. So I thought it was cool and wanted to see what happened next, but Steven Universe was still just a cartoon that I thought was neat. The emotional investment wasn't quite there yet, but the night Jailbreak aired, something happened. I mentioned my high school girlfriend at the time during the intro to this video. Well, long story short, her parents didn't want us dating. For, uh, reasons that are irrelevant to this video, but the B-roll will probably fill in the blanks. The night Jailbreak aired, we were busted by her parents, she got in a lot of trouble, and because we went to different schools, I was convinced I'd never see her again. Which was devastating because, aside from the teenage tendency to over-romanticize your relationships, this was someone who was one of my closest friends for years prior to dating. And it felt really bad knowing she was getting put through hell because of me. The next day, I felt broken, dragging my body through the hallways at school, looking like Omni-Man in space after he went full Mortal Kombat on his son. My graphic design teacher got me a pass to stay in her class all day. So I was there, at my desk, and just, uh cried? It was rough and I really didn't know what to do. I felt so lost. And then I came home and watched a brand new episode of Steven Universe centered around his moral dilemma of whether or not he wants Connie a part of his life now that he knows what's at stake. He saw the consequences of his own actions, how those consequences affect the people around him, and he didn't want to risk Connie getting hurt. The song Full Disclosure legitimately changed my life. It was the moment everything about this show clicked for me, especially when Steven sung, you don't have to be a part of this, I don't think I want you to be, you don't need this, you don't need me. I just stared at my TV like, I get it. I made Steven's ringtone in this app my ringtone for like two years bruh. I really felt understood, and I felt like I understood Steven. Not just with Connie, but the way Greg reacted reminded me of how my mom would react to distressing information that I didn't fully realize the gravity of when I told her. Now, I'm not saying all this for sympathy. Rather, I want to illustrate the power this show had for people in all sorts of situations. Not to mention, my hard-headed ass was kinda empowered by the end of this episode, and kept dating the girlfriend until the relationship fizzled out a few months later. I know Joe Break is the highlight of the Steven Bomb for a lot of people. But for me, it's full disclosure all the way. It comforted me in a way that no show, animated or live action, has done before. Something the series would continue to do for years afterwards. But anyways, the show exploding in popularity and pushing boundaries for LGBT relationships wasn't the only impact Stephen Baum had. As I'm sure most of you know, Cartoon Network learned the wrong lesson from this week-long event. They saw people loved this Stephen Baum and decided to do it again. And again, and again, and again. Most of these didn't even make sense as Steven Bombs. The second one, done three months later, was clearly just writing the hype of the format and gave us episodes that really had no through line when pieced together and would have been better suited as weekly premieres. The most egregious bomb being The Summer of Steven, airing a whole season's worth of episodes over the course of a month. Now I'm grateful for this event as it put this channel on the map back in the day, even if I would have done like everything differently today. But even though I owe a lot to this bomb, this was six months worth of weekly premieres churned out in a few weeks. It clearly is the catalyst of the many lengthy hiatuses found in seasons four and five. It affected other shows too, and not just on the network. Disney XD did a little star bomb in 2017 for the end of season two, and I think the beginning of season three, but I don't think those made the ways they thought it would. But for the time, this really solidified the week of March 9th, 2015 as one of the craziest weeks in animation history. But what if I told you it didn't stop there? Galactic Kids Next Door rules! Nigel Uno. What have you done? <laughs> All right. 
right, I'll be brief with this one because technically it happened the week after and I already made two videos on this over the years, but I gotta talk about the GKD experiment. My brain lumps it in with these other two. In March 2015, an account by the name of Number Vine started posting cryptic messages on Kiss Next Door fan pages via sites like Facebook. Eventually, this account starts spreading links to RainbowMonkeys.com that appeared to just be a looping animation of the iconic Kiss Next Door mascots. But when you clicked on the giant monkey's nose, the site morphed into a database for the galactic Kiss Next Door, entering different operative numbers and character names that would provide different statuses, and one code would take you to a countdown set to end on April 1st. Yeah, uh, people found the video file it was counting down to, like, two weeks ahead of time. Wouldn't be a Cartoon Network adjacent show in the mid-2010s if it didn't have leaks due to poor security. I'm hoping you guys know the story from here. If not, I encourage you to watch one of those videos we made. But basically, the video was an animatic for a proposed sequel series to Codename Kiss Next Door, titled Galactic Kiss Next Door, which was set up at the end of the original series. This animatic voiced by the original voice actors. Let me tell you, I was already geeked on the Ford and Garnet reveals, but convincing myself that Kids Next Door was rising up from the grave? There really wasn't a better time to be an animation fan. <coughs> oh god, I'm done. The message boards and theories were going crazy. It really felt like we were so back. Of course, the animatic wasn't supposed to leak, Warburton had to course correct, and ultimately, despite alluding to a meeting, Warburton informed the masses that Cartoon Network passed on picking up the series, leaving this as just a fun little moment in history to reminisce on. It's crazy to think that with the state of entertainment, animation, cable, streaming, and so on, we will probably never get a stacked week like this again, at least not for a while. Who knows? Everyone is reboot crazy right now, so maybe one day the stars will align, and we can get some new Gravity Falls and Steven content dropping in the same week. Maybe Galactic Kids Next Door will become a real show. Maybe Takaba will bring back the Blue Raspberry Freeze, because having one freeze based off a of soda, and the other two flavors being sweet, fruity freezes, is horribly unbalanced. I'm legitimately upset by this. Please subscribe to Kevin's Rabbit Hole, because I'm about to pop off. But with all that said, until we get another moment in animation history like this, I guess you just had to be there. Thanks for watching, consider subscribing, check out Toon Drip for some dope cartoon merch, and I'll see y'all later. Peace!